please join me to welcome Professor Lucina G. Bom dia a todos. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for waking up so early to come and attend this session. Uh, it's uh, such a wonderful and great pleasure for me to be here uh, and <clears throat> resuming my contact with people who are very dear to me but live so far apart. Um, the uh, new media networks and uh, email and so on helps to plug in some of the gaps but still the physical presence and for me, physicality, realism is so key. Uh, so the fact that I can really hug these people and kiss them is, is really uh, uh, an incredible emotion. Um, I think that the work that the people in São Carlos are doing is extremely important. And uh, the fact that they have uh, been central to so seeing that they've uh, now been um, fighting to create a uh, more wide-ranging postgraduate program. They already have a very, very successful MA. They are going to move on and have a PhD uh, program here very soon, I'm sure. Uh, it's all um, the uh, proof of their efforts and, and their dedication and their intellectual strength. I have to thank Susanna my dear former PhD student. Uh, I learned so much from her about uh, music and cinema, so she's obviously one inspiration for me to uh, think about intermediality. Uh, Lucia, who taught me so much about early Brazilian cinema, again, an area I knew nothing about and I'm still learning from her. Um, Flavia, who has a fantastic book on early cinema um, and again somebody that um, I'm constantly learning from. Uh, Samuel is going to be my dear research partner here. You're going to be doing hopefully this beautiful film called Passages and uh, without him that would not be possible. Um, and also thanks to my dear Reading colleagues uh, but they, they hear my thanks every day at Reading, so I'll be short on that front. Uh, I've said some words yesterday already about them. But anyway, it's a, an immense pleasure being here, and thank you all for organizing this wonderful conference. Um, okay, time to get started with serious talk. Um, let me see. I like this quote very much by Thomas L. Sasson and Marty Hagner. The cinema seems poised to leave behind its function as a medium for the representation of reality in order to become a life form and thus a reality in its own right. You will see very soon why I uh, chose these quotes to represent the, the relationship between cinema and the real is probably the most central and complex issue in film studies. As far as our intermedia research project is concerned, I believe it to be key. What is there in the uh, prefix inter, forming the word intermedia, that interests us so much? Why do we devote so much time and money to thinking and talking about it? Can the interface between media, that is, the passage from one medium to another, the information exchange between two or more different media, have any value in itself? Surely this phenomenon has to bear consequences to our lives and to society in general in order to be worth to address this question, my focus today will be <clears throat> on those works which embrace cinema's intermediate nature with a political intent and to political ends. 
In what follows, I shall test the extent to which these rifts endeavor to have transformative effects on the reality around them. I am certainly not the first to sense the gravitas of the real in the state of in-betweenness that characterizes cinema from its inception. Agnes Fetter, for example, warns us that the medium is not just a vehicle for me, but physical content itself. She says, and you can see the quotes there, theories of medium have called attention to the way in which it is never directly the meaning or the pure message that we perceive in a communication, but the material mediality of the signification which unavoidably shapes our construction of meaning. Richard Rushton, in turn, defends the idea that films are not simply representation of reality or a deficient and secondary mode of reality. Instead, they are reality themselves, or in his words, filmic reality. Given that everything we see and hear in a film instantly becomes part of our lived experience. Outside the intermediate sphere, critics such as Lavos Chitek have identified the girl of the real, this is his expression, in the virtual form of film, a subject dear, for example, to semioticians and linguists such as Roman Jakobsen, who highlights as one of cinema's main properties the ability to combine sign and reference. He says, this is easier for you to follow. <coughs> is there a contradiction between these two pieces? Film operates by the object. Film operates by the sign. The contradiction between these two pieces had already been discussed by St. Augustine. This brilliant fifth century thinker who subtly distinct, distinguished the thing, rest, from the sign, signal, shows that alongside the signs, whose essential function is to signify something, there are things that we can utilize with the function of sign. It is precisely this optical and acoustic thing changed into sign that constitutes the specific matter of cinema. So my proposal in this talk will be to investigate the material life that pulsates in the intersection between the film medium and real life. <coughs> my focus will fall onto the passage, the intersection, the fleeting moment where both film and life merge before becoming themselves again. This is the moment in which I wish to play. They become artistic and political. The analysis of some representative works by Beth Blanche, Claudia Sees, Paul Caldas, and Marcelo Luna will follow in order to buttress my arguments that their transitionality between artistic media, real life, social classes, and not least, between themselves. I would like to start by showing a clip of an utterly accomplished example of the political circuit that connects film, the other arts, and life in recent Brazilian cinema. I'm referring to the film uh, Delicate Crime, Crime Delicate, by Beto Branch, 2005. I have devoted a full chapter uh, to this film in my book, World Cinema and the Ethics of Realism, but there's still more to say about it. I never end the finding things and discovering gems inside this film. Um, the film's heightened level of intermediality begins with it being the screen adaptation of Sergio Santana's homonymous novella, going on to change consecutively into theatre and painting without recognizing frontiers between any of these different art forms. One of the film's narrative strands focuses on uh, Inés, a young woman who has a disability both in the film and in real life. She doesn't have a leg. 
She models for a painter, José Torres Campana, played by Mexican diplomat Felipe Ehrenberg, who is also a painter in real life. At a certain point, Inés is shown posing for the film's key painting called Pas de Deux.
parte che inventa il mio ancora sì sì, può essere non si vuole un pesce
is in, in that painting of this uh, piece called Pas de Deux, is that the real painter and the real model agreed to create an artwork in real life whilst uh, simultaneously playing fictional characters in a film. The fact that this involved full nudity and physical intimacy between both, and that to that end, the model, who is disabled in real life, had to remove her prosthetic leg before the camera, indicates the transformative effects the film necessarily had on the actor, actor's real life. The resulting picture has as it, uh, in its center, as you have seen, a erect penis placed next to a dilated vulva, implying that if the painting was real, so was the sexual arousal between painter and model. Suggestively, the male organ appears as a substitute of the missing leg, filling in the representational gap that allows for art and sex to become reality. This example is central to my line of inquiry, first of all, because of its passages from life to art and vice versa, starting with a physical encounter between two real characters that turns into drawing, then into painting, and then back to real life causing the model to be overcome with emotion when observing the result on the canvas. But it also raises questions around film's dubious status as art, despite or even because it is all about the making of an artwork as it happens. Indeed, the everlasting dispute around Sigler's artistic claims is centered precisely on the fact that, as a recording medium, it entertains an unmediated relationship uh, with objective reality, as opposed to the other mimetic or representational arts whose association with the real filters through the artist's creative mind and hand. Krakauer's uh, much contested realist theory is incisive in this respect when he states, and uh, you can see the quote there, Due to its fixed meaning, the concept of art does not and cannot cover truly cinematic films. Films, that is, which incorporate aspects of physical reality with a view to making us experience them. And yet, it is they, not the films reminiscent of traditional artworks, which are valid aesthetically. If film is an art at all, it certainly should not be confused with the established art. Before Kakawa, Arnheim had already embraced a similar line of approach by saying, film resembles painting, music, literature, and the dance. In this respect, it is a medium that may, but need not, be used to produce artistic results. More recently, Alain Badiou has refined this thought in the following terms. It is effectively, oh, I'm sorry, I think uh, this is Alain and this is Badiou. It is effectively impossible to think cinema outside of something like a general space in which you could grasp its connection to the other arts. Cinema is the seventh art in a very particular sense. It does not add itself to the other six while remaining on the same level as them. Rather, it implies them. Cinema is the plus one of the arts. It operates on the other arts using them as its starting point in a movement that subtracts them from themselves. My own view resonates with and aspires to Arthur Badiou's understanding by attempting to explain the ways in which real life, rather than undermining, politicizes film's artistic endeavor. Reflecting on the politics of intermediality, Schroeder reminds us that since the 1960s, when the term first started to be used, 
intermediate art forms have aspired to abolish the schism between art and life. Along the same lines, I shall argue that this real-life politics constitutes the very artistic arena where the films I am focusing on operate. By physically engaging crew and cast in the production of artworks within the film, be it painting, theatre, literature, or any other art forms, and by committing these works, works to political causes, they subordinate intermediality to social change. But before progressing further on the analysis of other uh, bits of films that I'm, I'm going to be showing you, a disclaimer is in order to, as refers to genre. In fact, all the films I have chosen to analyze here, though not exactly popular, can be described as conventional future-length fiction films intended for commercial distribution and exhibition um, at traditional outlets. The wisdom of my choice could be questioned uh, in that the intersection between real life and film would seem much more evident in radical ventures such as extended cinema experiments involving live performance or else works that provide comprehensive spectatorial immersion, such as virtual reality films. In order to justify my choice, I will briefly summarize the taxonomy I have developed in order to address the possible meanings of cinematic realism. As you can see here, I start with realism, realism derived from modes of production. Here, um, I would uh, include physical engagement on the part of crew and cast with the pro filming event, identity between casts and their roles, real location shooting, emphasis on the index. Um, the second mode would be uh, realism derived from modes of address to the flat screen films aiming at eliciting narrative realism, films eliciting reality effects by means of graphic representation, and the opposite of these two, uh, films that unveil the reality of the medium. Uh, the third mode would be realism derived from modes of exhibition, films that include live performances such as, such as in an expanded cinema experiments. And the last uh, category would be realism derived from modes of reception. The reality effect is obtained through spectatorship employing 3D and IMAX environments and 4D virtual reality devices. These are, by the way, not restricted to new technology. As we saw in Ian Christie's talk yesterday, panoramas were already trying to elicit that kind of immersive spectator. Um, most theories on cinematic realism are concerned with the last category, that is, with realism at reception point. It is indeed a fact that, regardless of their recording processes, audiovisual media can affect uh, spectators through the so-called reality effect by means of graphic representations able to cause physical and emotional impact even when there is no representation of realism at play. For example, when the physical impact on the spectator derives from animation or computer-generated images and sounds. Traditional 2D screenings of action films are perfectly capable of producing reality effects, but particular techniques such as 3D projections, IMAX, uh, and the more recent 4D virtual reality devices have been specifically designed to enhance them. Whatever the case, however, reality effects are always more effects than reality, given the interdiction of actual spectator or spectatorial participation. Even reality, uh, the, the virtual reality devices, uh, though allowing the spectator to move their heads uh, freely and choose what to look within uh, a 360 uh, degree spectrum are nonetheless unable to provide any kind of actual interaction. You can't interact with the film, although it seems that you are in the actual in 
environment. As uh, Christian Metz uh, was the first to note, there is an indelible fracture between seeing and being seen in films, uh, in any of these films I just mentioned to you, due to the temporal gap that separates the moment of filming from that of viewing. And this is why for, for Metz, the spectator's position at any film screen is necessarily scope of viewing. Reality effects are moreover subordinate to the varying subjective susceptibilities, hence impossible to measure by universal standards. As a rule, however, a te uh, as technology evolves and tricks are cracked, reality effects tend to wane with time and lose their battle against the human brain that opposes a natural resistance to illusionism. A historical example is that of the audience members who purportedly fainted or ran away when first exposed to Lumière's arrival of the train at La Ciotat in 1895, a film which has become perfectly innocuous to current day spectators. As Oliver Brown actually explains, when a new medium of illusion is introduced, it opens a gap between the power of the image's effect and conscious reflective distancy in the observer. This gap narrows again with increasing ex exposure and there is a reversion to conscious appraisal. Habituation cheats away at the illusion and soon it no longer has the power to captivate. It becomes stale and the audience are hardened to its attempts at the illusion. At this stage, the observers are uh, receptive to content and artistic media competence until finally a new medium with even greater appeal to the senses and greater suggestive power comes along and casts a spell of the illusion over the, the audience again. So um, we, uh, uh, the, the way we let ourselves deluded by what film is showing us is something that decreases with habit. So you get used to that and then you don't uh, feel the power of illusion anymore. So that's what he's explaining. And certainly this is going to happen to uh, VR effects and, and uh, 360 degrees experiences. As for modes of exhibition, there is an undeniable political intent in the realistic endeavor of films involving live performance. Expanded cinema experiments are the ultimate expression of this category, insofar as they preserve the oratic Eichmannlichkeit, or uniqueness, held by Benny as the very definition of an artwork. However, for the same reason, they also have to relent on the recording and replicating properties of the film medium, aimed at reaching the masses, the public, without which, as Bazan claimed, there is no cinema, as well as to the possibility of preserving their achievements to posterity. Film study schools alone are therefore insufficient to address such phenomena. As for modes of address, Realism must possibly be associated with the impression of reality elicit, elicited by what Baudry famously defined as the basic cinematographic apparatus, l'appareil de base, including the projector, the flat screen, and the darn collective auditorium. Despite film's vertiginous technolo technological development since its invention and the multiplication of its uses, uh, supports and platforms, the basic cinematographic apparatus as provided by, cinema, uh, by the cinema auditorium has demonstrated extraordinary resilience, remaining for over a century the standard outlet for filmic experience. This endurance, I believe, is due to the comfort zone it affords the spectator between the reality effect and the natural brain resistance to total illusionism. It is moreover a space capable of accommodating a range of cinematic genres and styles, from classical narrative cinema of closure, devoted to eliciting an impression of reality, 
to mixed genre productions endowed with disruptive devices that draw attention to the reality of the medium, such as the films I am interested in here. And I think Delicate Crime is a prime example of this. Moreover, as Arnheim had already noted, human 3D perception of reality is itself an illusion, given that the human retina is as flat as the traditional cinema screen. The three-dimensional impression we have of objective reality is only produced thanks to our stereoscopic vision that promotes the fusion of two slightly different images uh, resulting from the distance between our eyes. All this to say that my chosen case studies sit entirely within the first category of modes of production, relying heavily on the physical engagement on the part of crew and cast with the performing event, the near identity between the cast and their roles, real location shooting, and films inherit, inherit uh, indexical properties. So you have seen all these qualities in the abstract I have just shown. In these films, the illusionistic fictional thread interweaves with documentary footage and crew and cast direct interference into the historical world, aimed not only at highlighting the reality of the medium, but also at producing as well as reproducing social reality. Needless to say, none of the modes above exist per se a film relying on physical engagement at production point being only thus conceived for the specific, specific reality effect it is expected to have on the spectator, of course. And this is incidentally confirmed by the extract from the epic crime I have just shown, in which the actor's physical engagement in the live production of an artwork leads to the actress's emotional reaction when within the film she becomes a spectator of the resulting painting. There is no doubt that her thoughts at that point are real. Modes of production are, however, I wish to argue, the only objective way of proofing and proving a film's intention, given the countless variables inflecting the ways in which films are subjectively perceived by each individual. So that's why I, ch I chose modes of production, because there you have the proof and the evidence of how the film was made. Whereas to, to analyze the degree of realism at reception point, you're always subjected to the, the different sensibilities of each individual spectator. Okay, now I'm going to move to some more intermediate passages. Um, after I have clarified uh, what I mean by realism as a mode of production. Um, in his posthumous magnum opus, Das Passagenwerk, uh, in English, The uh, Arcades Project, Walter Benjamin refers to all definitions of the Parisian passages or arcades as a city, a world in miniature. In its connect, uh, connective and agglutinary role, the Parisian passages are at once conducive and final, roads to somewhere else and destination for commerce, socialization, and habitation. Conflating the ephemeral and the permanent, passages were for Benjamin the site of utopia, as he beautifully describes in this passage here. In the dream in which each epoch entertains images of its successor, the latter appears wedded to elements of private history, Urgeschichte, that is, to elements of a classless society. And the experience of such a society as stood in the unconscious of the collective, engendered through internet penetration with what is now the utopia that has left its trace in a thousand configurations of life, from enduring edifices to passing fashions. 
Along the same lines, I would like to define my chosen case studies by the utopian passages. They are the sudden condensation of the real of the in-betweenness as defined by Cato, but also the point of production of connections between fiction and the document, as well as between filmmakers united through the whole of a classless society. Again here, Delicate Pride gives me the opportunity to elaborate on an encounter, this time between two oppositional, uh, op opposing regions of Brazil, São Paulo and Pernambuco, uh, which are prominently represented within the intermediate project. I have uh, two colleagues from Pernambuco, and I am from São Paulo, and we are working together and creating passages. Another of the film's intermediate aspects uh, relates to theater. I'm talking still about that. And in the same way that we see painting in the making, uh, the theater plays shown in the film are extracts of real spectacles running in the city of Sao Paulo when the film was made. These in turn interweave with the story of protagonist Antonio Martins, a theater critic played by Marco Di. Fictional though this character is, he is also constantly interacting with real life characters, not least the Pernambucan film director Claudia Seath, the one at the top, uh, who makes a, a cameo appearance as a rowdy, jealous lover in a bar, in a short theatrical sketch for the sole enjoyment of Antoine Martins. Now, Sissi's appearance in Paulista and Brunt's film is not accidental and indicates that both directors had conversing, had been conversing through their films, not least I, as I hope to demonstrate by creating intermediate passages. Both Brunt and Assis had started in the film business in the dark era of the late 1980s and early 1990s in Brazil, when a stagnant film industry led to massive migration of filmmakers to the advertisement branch. Several of them devoted themselves to commercial music videos, uh, working together with a blooming generation of popular musicians at the time, including Chico Science and Fred Zerbat in Pernambuco, Urraca in Rio, uh, and Os Titãs and Sabotage in Sao Paulo. It is both tragic and a testament to the violent society they were addressing that some of these musicians lost their lives, sabotage and Chico Science among them, or were gravely injured, like Marcelo Yuka of Uhaka, while at the height of their productivity. Bert and Assis directly applied the skills acquired through music video making to the social critique developed later in their future length films. To illustrate this point, I will now show extracts from two concomitant films of 2002, made respectively by Beto Branchi, The Trespasser of Invasor, and Claudia Cis, Mango Yellow, or Amarelo Mano. These, in my view, ideally reflect the director's intermediate and realist drive. First, by turning film into music. Second, by establishing a link between characters, classes, and social environments. And lastly, by nationalizing and internationalizing regional, regional issues with the help of rap and pop music. In the Trespasser, the title role of Hitman Amizu is played by Paul Vickers. You are going to be seeing him in a minute a musician and a member of the band Os Titãs, for whom Brandt made several music videos. Anisio is hired by a property developer to kill one of his partners, Esteban. As well as exceeding his commission by killing both Esteban and his wife, Anisio manages to penetrate the property developer's uh, luxurious home and seduce his daughter, Marina. Anisio and Marina then embark on a trip into Sao Paulo's poor periphery, edited in the face of a rap by Sabotage, who is also a character in the film. 
The result is a swimming family that collects documentary snapshots put together at the pace of Sabotage's rap song, Na Zona Sul, about the miserable southern zone of Sao Paulo and its difficult daily life. This is a quote from the rap. At this point, thanks to the jump cuts, the favela appears as a natural continuation of the noble quarters of the city. The breaking of geographic boundaries caused by the brusque cuts results in striking and entirely recognizable evidence of the state of aesthetic communion among Brazilian urban social classes, although, of course, they still remain economically apart. The way that real life interweaves with fiction here through a typically intermediate procedure, combining film and music, was shockingly enhanced by the fact that sabotage, the great revelation in the cast of the trespasser, was murdered soon after the opening of the film as a result of an ongoing gang war. I'm now going to show this clip. And again, Tô a fim de pintar as paredes aí de azul. Você vai ver a escolha. Azul, azul molhado. Já reparou as nuvens? Elas são azuis. Elas se movem de canto para canto, de espaço para espaço. Vão levando todas as forças negativas de dentro da casa. Levando tudo para as ondas do mar sagrado. Azul, azul da força. De Odin. Odin? É, azul de Odin. Odin, príncipe do vento. E ó, tá mexendo uma um rosa também. Um rosa, um rosa vem assim, zelhado, assim nas portas. Já o refusco. Ó, tanto as forças do bem quanto as forças do mal. É o seguinte, cara, aqueles dias que você está assim, que você tá aquela mal olhado, cara. Não, é assim, tipo, doiado. Você está me entendendo? Que aí você, porra, você abre a mente, cara. Olha pra cima. Vou botar um sol.
that are present in each single shot of this clip. They come from poetry, um, and um, this is actually an extract from um, um, a writer, Hernando Camilo Chicanos. And what he says is here, um, oh no, it's not here. So I'll briefly read it. Yellow is the color of the tables, the benches, the stools, the fish knife handles, the hoe and the sickle, the bull cart of the yokes, of the old hats, of the dried meat, yellow, of the diseases, of the children's runny eyes, of the purulent wounds, of the spit, of the worms, of hepatitis, of diarrhea, of the rotten teeth, interior time yellow, old, washed out, sick. It starts yellow as normal objects and it just goes into the dirty underbelly of society. And I think this is what it does connecting these different layers of society. So in both sequences, music, real life, and social critique combine in an inextricable manner at a moment in which film averts itself as passage, conduit, material in between us and political intermediality. But to complete my analysis, I will now turn to one of the most eloquent intermediate encounters of political intent in Brazilian cinema, this time explicitly uniting São Paulo and Pernambuco in a perfect symmetry to my previous example of the encounter between Pernambuco and Claudio Cis and Paulista and Beto Branch. It is uh, the documentary film The Little Prince's Rap Against the Wicked Souls, who have the weekend of Prince and Pico Casal and Cebosas, made in 2000 by Paulo Caldas and Marcelo Luna, just a couple of years before the Trespasser and Manguiello. The film focuses on a vigilante or justice called Elin, Elin José Muniz, currently in jail for his numerous killings, as well as on a character uh, in all antipodal to him, Alexandre Garnizé, the drummer of hip hop and uh, band Faces do Suburbo, who is devoted to educational and charitable work. Both characters hail from Camaragibi, a dormitory town in the periphery of Recife, where crime and impunity thrive. But when music offers, as suggested by an Oscar critic, um, uh, Felipe Brito Gama, um, uh, the utopia of social change. The scene in question brings together members of Pernambuco's Fascista Suburbio and São Paulo's Racionais MCs, two famous uh, bands at the time. The extract starts with Mel Brown and Ice Blue from Hashanai's MCs enjoying a typical Northeastern meal of jerked beef and boiled manioc on a roof terrace in Camaraji. Whilst chatting about, about the record levels of uh, criminality in Sao Paulo's southern zone, so we are talking about the same zone in Sao Paulo, but they are now in a city, the two look down onto the sprawling favela landscape and identify each of its sections with Pavel from that area of Sao Paulo. So Sao Paulo overlaps with Recife. This preludes one of the most symbolic passages ever shot in Brazilian cinema, I think, consisting of an aerial long take of around two minutes over the never-ending favelas around Recife, to the sound of uh, rap Salvi, composed by the two characters whose lyrics uttered from the perspective of someone behind bars, salutes the populations from favelas from São Paulo, Rio, and Belo Horizonte. As the names of these communities are called out in an interminable list, space-time realism, enabled by the long take, offers indexical evidence to the connection of all Brazilian regions through their underbelly of poverty. I'm going to show this last clip now, and then wrap up my, my talk.
ada si Paisia Eksis, tak eksis Tak berita kebera, di mana 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 Também, porque o cara está fazendo essa guerra agora. Os caras estão colocando esse ódio aí, mas está mais dentro da gente. Eles fazem esse papel. Eles também se amam, para a gente está maior. Para eles está bom, eles estão colocando esse dia. Porque os caras estão aqui. Eu sei que eu não consigo tirar o que eu não estou vendo. Eu não tinha que ser. Já de hoje, a passa patrônica, a corredor, é isso aí. Não, não, não. Olha o cara da Casa Branca ali, o Capão, lá em cima daquela zona que ele paga o São Luís, lá na Casa da Casa Branca, lá de cima, o Pai de Santo Antônio. Isso é o quê? É isso que eu tenho, é o Brasil, 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 é o Parque do Engenho, Genivá, Jardim Rosano, Pirajussá, Santa Tereza, Parque de Lima, Parque de Santo Antônio, Capelinha, Jomorá, Vila Calu, Branca Flor, Paranapanema e Aracati, Novo Oriente, Parque Ararima, Jardim Igá, Parque B, Pessoal da Sabi, Jardim Marcelo, Cidade Ademar, Jardim São Carlos, Jardim Primavera, Santa Média, Jardim Santa Terezinha, Jardim Mia, Vila Santa Catarina, Aí Vietnã, Cocai, Cipó, Colônia, Campanari de Adema, Calupe de São Bernardo, Vila Industrial e Santo André, Bairro das Pimentas, Brasilândia, Jardim Japão, Jardim Hebron, Coab 1, Coab 2, São Mateus, Itaí, Cidade de Tiradentes, Barueri, Coab de Tarcos, Bandeira, Morel, Cidade de Deus, Iaí, Ideia, Expansão, Menor, Pesu, Iaí, Pessoal do Sul, Destina, Iaí, Quebrada, Zona Noroeste, Santos, Rádio Favela, PH, e para todos os aliados espalhados pelas favelas do Brasil, viva! Todos os DJs, todos os MC, que fazem do rap a trilha sonora do meio. E por cima da puta, ele quer jogar minha cabeça pros povo. Aí tenta sorte, mano. Eu acredito na palavra de um homem de pele escura, de cabelo preso, que andava entre mendigos e leprosos, pregando a igualdade. Um homem chamado Jesus. Só ele sabe a minha hora. Aí ladrão, tô saindo fora. Mas. Okay, um, as Arturo Grande is there, reminds us, every shots of favelas have a long history in Brazilian cinema, harking back to Rio 40 grounds, uh, Rio 40 degrees, from 1955 and are invariably intended to define the country's national identity through its territories of poverty. The extraordinary event in this particular long take is, however, its intermediality, through which, like in the other examples, music provides the virtual medium of film with a passage to reality. Granted, the ways the lyrics suggest that social change can only be attained through religion, for those of you who didn't understand, what he's saying here is that everything is going to be resolved by a figure of a, a black man who walked among beggars and lepers, and the name of this man, uh, the, this man is Jesus. Uh, so this um, solution through religion had already been dismissed as ineffective as far back as 1964 in Glauber Harsha's Black World White Devil. This, however, does not detract from the documentary physical truth provided by the interminable name calling of favelas across Brazil. They are all here. Um, the indexical images of real continuous favelas 
and not least the reality of death, which this and so many favela films in Brazil are all about. Elinho, the main character in this film, it must be noted, was the author of 44 deaths at the time of the film. And his ongoing trial had already sentenced him to 99 years in jail. He had actually passed 44 lives. The verb passar, or to pass, in Portuguese, also meaning to kill or waste in the favela slang, abundantly explored in the favela films made in those days. By passing over to the other side of the prison walls through the conduit of music, the film puts us fleetingly in touch with utopia and its artistic reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucia, for your stimulating speech and with so many stimulating ideas. Well, let's open to some questions. say that if anybody wants to ask questions in Portuguese, that's fine. We can then clarify in English. Hello. Uh, hi, Lucia. Thank you so much for your talk. I have Quite a few questions that I'll try and maybe post to now very briefly and then see how the debate goes. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of your taxonomy and realism, you have uh, given us modes of production and modes of address in separate categories. And in terms of modes of production, that's what you are concentrating on. Um, I was wondering, in relation to um, the trespassers clip that you showed us, that is supposed to be taking place in the south of Sao Paulo, but in fact it was shot in the north of Sao Paulo. Does that uh, complicate, if, if, if you want to speak about proof, proving your point and, um, I don't know, if that is really important, the mode of production, if that is crucial to your argument, does it matter that Beth Brun just shot that in the north? And um, in relation to music, in this one, the last one that you showed us, um, if music is also so crucial, is it important to know that Portishead actually wrote the music to which uh, Mono Brown is singing? So it's actually a sample from a Bristol band. And what does that entail yeah. to this clip? And again, in relation to both, um, do you take into account the outsider's point of view of both directors and their distance? So if you have, a, you have an aerial shot and you have someone sitting on the passenger seat of a car looking into a reality um, that they do not belong to, I mean the character in the trespasser, the girl, she does not belong to that periphery. So she's looking from a distance as well as the director. And here in this film as well, the director is looking from a distance. So is, is that something that, because I, is content important to your taxonomy of realism? That, that is the main, main question in terms of is subject, subject matter, where does it enter in, into realist modes? Yeah, uh, as, as I said during my talk, I'm talking about conventional narrative films that have a plot, and the plot is fiction. Um, and my interest is precisely in that combination of indexical realism and the fiction, how these things uh, walk together throughout. Like in the scene of the painting, there is uh, endless numbers of cuts. So this, the, the, the scene that takes 10 minutes was shot during many days in which the, the uh, picture was being done. Uh, and we can see that the characters are wearing different clothes, that the, the position of the screen is different, and all that kind of thing. So, um, but 
there are some elements that mean that these uh, that uh, guarantees the seal of authenticity to the cause that these films are defending. And that's what I think uh, matters in terms of the politics. They are attaching the, the link to reality. All the time they are worried about showing real favelas, whether it's, and you're making the point that uh, the favela shots were in the Petrescus, uh, in the north, but the south is also full of them, and the music is about the, the, the southern zone. Uh, when uh, the happy, the uh, Pequeno Príncipe, uh, Mano Brown, is singing about Belo Horizonte, São Paulo, um, and um, Rio, he, and the favelas are in Recife, or around Recife. This also suggests the unity, how that thing about the, the national identity through the, um, uh, the question of poverty and misery that surrounds those rich areas and how aesthetically they are connected is what I think is the most amazing achievement of these filmmakers. Um, I also mentioned here that they uh, not just nationalize the question, uh, singular questions to particular places, they are expanded onto a, a national uh, question. Uh, they connect the several parts of Brazil, they contextualize, which is another realist procedure, contextualizing, showing where these things are coming from. But they also internationalize. That's something that um, Chic Science, Money Beach was doing all the time, borrowing from um, uh, pop music from all over the world. And so I think this is, again, a conversation, another passage, um, uniting people um, around one cause, which is a social cause. They are trying to address social causes there. Um, and although we may not agree with what the, the words in the lyrics are saying, uh, because the, the final solution is Jesus, and Brazil is going through that in many respects with all these leaders, evangelical leaders who keep preaching that all the time. Um, the images are showing something different. They are not showing that the solution is Jesus. Um, they, they, are, uh, they are interviewing characters in the film who are uh, pointing out to the two possible solutions. One of them is you become doing justice with your own hands, killing people. Uh, and another solution which is educational and Ganizer, who is a rapper and a drummer himself, uh, devoted <coughs> to educational projects and, and charitable projects. So I think what matters in all these cases are precisely those dialogues between fiction, between uh, manipulation and non-manipulation, between the index and the story. I don't know if I answered your question. I'm not, not at all saying that, I, that we should believe in the reality of everything we see, no. productive 
to join in your taxonomy. The both ends of the uh, division, which means production, which you really put up and, 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 and centralize with reception. Well, uh, I think it becomes more, more productive to, to understand things or to make us revise even classical uh, definitions of fiction and documentary. And I'm thinking about this because uh, I remember in another meeting in England with Babenko <laughs> that I, I, I think that was in Leeds also, I don't remember. Yes. We had the chance to be with him for three or four days. And I talked to him about something that always struck me as a, a, a very nice example to be brought to this kind of talk we heard here, which is he shot uh, not only as a character, because we could say that's a biopic based on something that comes from physical reality. But a special sequence, actually it's not a sequence, it's just a brief moment treated as a plan sequence, as a, a short sequence, where, I don't know if people will remember this, where Pichotti is trying to write, and he's really actually writing, probably for the first time, or copying something from a blackboard, which when you have a professor, and I think she writes something like, a terra é redonda como uma laranja. Something, do you remember this? Anybody? I think it's something like that. And I remember, I asked uh, Baten Perdetta in England, um, if he rehearsed that, how many times he did to get that. For me, it's an amazing, for me, it's the best moment of the whole film. That's, it's less than one minute, maybe even in some seconds. And he said he did only once. Because I was wondering why he placed the camera at the bottom like on a, on a counter sheet kind of position so that he could get, we wouldn't see the, the hand of the shot, we would see his face while he was writing a terra que tonta como uma laranja, something like that. And it's really amazing because that's, it's, I mean, the, 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 the division between fiction and documentary is completely and that's one of the moments when the physical reality becomes, comes to the front. And you really forget that you are watching a film. So that comes to the, uh, the first moments of your, of your talk. And I'd like you to comment on this. But the question is that um, like when we combine reset, uh, uh, production, and I'm talking here about film language and mise en scène, and then reception, uh, we are also mixing, the, in those moments that I saw, mixing these classic conceptions of documentary and fiction. And then we can talk, for example, within the fiction, like, like, like what I'm talking with the shot, which is also confusing because it's a biopic based on someone that comes from reality. But I was thinking of just about uh, 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 fiction when we talk, when we, we listen, for, for example, Godard talking about Anna Karina's faces in Viva Savi, for example, when he also says that it's a fiction film, but it's also a documentary about Karina's faces. And when we think about, for example, another example of film history, John Cassavetes and his relationship with his actors and actresses within specific moments of his brilliant filmography as well. So, uh, so this is what was intriguing, if uh, your presentation here can help us revise again, bring it back again, uh, the revision, a revisionist uh, thought about the classical division between documentary and fiction. But when I'm talking about this, I'm joining those two modes that you divide the, the mode of production with the mode of reception, which I think can help us to bring back again and then include Bazan and think about Bazan in his defense of the, uh, of the uh, plot sequence. Uh, the second thing is just a, a, a commentary that your presentation made me think about is I think it's, it would be really very interesting to devise a film course, a one semester course on 
of that moment when the big ideas come into resistance. That moment. And the role of music again in that appropriation. And when I saw uh, Mariel Manga again here, and then also brought it again, basically, uh, just now, it reminded me that made me think that we are at, with the leftovers of the video clip language being inscribed within Brazilian cinema. Again, like the, the in Mariel Manga from the Dead Soviet. And also, uh, we have also, when you have, uh, that, that's the opposite of the plan sequence that we have in how to become a publicity, because it's all edited, especially a Mariel Manga. And a Mariel Manga for me, really, looking today, looked like a video game of that, the, the 80s video game. And I think that the favela, that's an assumption that the favela, the periphery, gets strength in Brazilian cinema at that moment. And it would be interesting to see a collection of those films and relate, this is a, 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 a project, and relate that to, uh, to the music, to the role of music at that moment. Sorry for Thank being you. so... Jean-Louis, yeah, let's bring you to ready to give that course to us about the <laughs> films of the periphery. Uh, I think it would be great, really. Um, Going back to your point about uh, modes of reception and modes of production, um, they, obviously they are never conceived separately. And those things, any taxonomy uh, is schematic and reductive. But it can help us understand because there is so much confusion and I think all that debate created between the psychoanalytic approach to film studies um, that was so criticized by Bordeaux, No Carroll, and so on, uh, and then by the uh, phenomenological uh, criticism that, that um, emerged in the wake of Deleuze, uh, on the basis that the a spectator was infantilized, was thought to be back into the mirror stage, uh, of the Lacanian mirror stage, and so on, and that no spectator was like that, of course, because the spectator had their subjectivities, intelligence, rationale, and all that. That's because there is that crucial misunderstanding that uh, the Laura Mulvey and everybody else who were talking about. Um, subject position within this, the cinema, they are talking about modes of address. They were not talking about modes of reception. They were not preoccupied with individual spectators. They were talking about how the film was trying to position the spectator. And they were not saying that the, the spectator will come and, and, and sit in that particular position and that everybody is going to see the film in the same manner. So that was a a, a huge misunderstanding of criticism. And Laura Mulvey is and as valid today as it was when, when she wrote her beautiful Visual Pleasures article. And we cannot stop quoting her because she was absolutely right. She found something, she discovered something that we cannot live without to this date. And this is how the camera position uh, in front of the spectators also implies a position, a spectatory position. But that's nothing to do with real life spectators. It's just the mode of address. She was not, however, talking so much about modes of production. Who talked about it is Bassan. Because Bassan was worried about realism. And I am worried about realism too. Bassan talked about uh, the long take and the long shot. Um, as a, a means of preserving space-time continuity within the shot and created the concept of uh, ontology of this and that, etc. We know all that. So he was worried about how the film was made. I am also worried about how the film was made. I'm not against any of the other modes. I'm not saying now everybody stop thinking about reception, blah, blah, and think of, no. What I'm saying is, I'm talking about realism, and in order to talk about realism, I need to look at modes of production. So if other people are not talking about realism, there is no reason why they should 
not look at the other modes. And indeed, phenomenology and um, haptic spectatorship is absolutely fascinating as a field of study. And then you have to write what Vivian Sobchak has written about how a film inflects her. And she writes her, as is many of them, in the first person, saying, I felt this and that when I watched the piano. And this is valid, but she's not saying every single person who watches this film is going to feel the same way towards the piano. And it would be stupid to say so, because it's not. Each spectator will react in a different manner. And there are um, determinants of class, of gender, of culture, that changes the way completely that you watch the film. So this is to clarify what I hope will be the uses of this taxonomy, is to see exactly where you were coming from when you address the film and what you were talking about. Um, have I answered all of you, please? Hello, uh, my name is Marcel, and uh, I'd like to uh, propose a few questions uh, I'm going to explain uh, my point. Uh, you, uh, your main, main interest was on uh, the mode of production as a basis for realism in the films you chose to analyze here. Uh, but at the same time, you mentioned the static procedures they used to uh, form the sequences you showed. So, uh, traveling, jump cuts, and aerial shots, uh, etc. So uh, I'd like to, you to further comment on uh, those aesthetic procedures and specifically if you see uh, some relationship between uh, them and uh, these, uh, the, the way in which those films are creating passages uh, uh, as you uh, use that concept in your talk. Uh, and uh, being a little more uh, specific, uh, I think, uh, as I understand it, you uh, used, you saw music in those sequences as, as ways uh, of, as a way of expanding uh, the, the spatial uh, and the thematic reach of those sequences. So, uh, I'd like to move on with another question that uh, would be something like, uh, does music can be a part or one of the, the elements of uh, uh, the construction of uh, what uh, one may call creative geographies, to recall uh, that concept uh, of Lev Kuleshov. Uh, the idea is, so in that concept, to create an idea of a continuous space and time through uh, shots from different spaces and times. So it's a fictional procedure, but uh, maybe we can displace it to uh, think about uh, a realistic use of creative geography. Uh, I'd like you to comment on that as well. And, uh, can I answer those two first and then you Yes, you of course. Going back to the first one about the um, technical procedures um, to make those shots, um, I think it's it's crucial uh, the way you you approach because my question about realism does not involve solely the cast but also the crew. Um, if if you remember the first clip I showed of delicate crime. Um, you have, may have noticed that it was very dark. Obviously, it, the quality was very bad here, but the original is already dark. Um, the fact that it's dark is because they had to turn down the lights to create an atmosphere for the actors conducive to their uh, creation. Um, 
the actress was for the very first time in her life removing her prosthetic leg in front of anybody. And this she did not in front of one person, but in front of whoever watches this film. It was a life-changing event for her, and if you watch the extras of the film, you will see the impact that this thing is having her life. So that's the beginning of that scene. Um, and the, the low light, the very few uh, uh, group members that were there in order not to interrupt, and that lasted for quite a long time, many, many days until the work was done, um, were essential for the creation of the scene the way we see this now. Obviously, there is editing, there is a number of other tricks. There is no music, as you can see. Um, and uh, to move on to your second, just, just to, uh, to complete, this, the way that this scene was created reminds me very much of the realm of the senses in which it was a, a decision of cast and crew uh, to change their own behaviors, to break up with monogamous uh, marriage. The, the actor who played the film had a family, his wife, and they agreed that during the film, she would be having somebody else, probably liking her very, very much. And that was necessary for the film to, to become what was intended. And Oshima describes the environment in which they shot many of the sex scenes as religious. It was like a ritual, very low light. The, the, the crew, he said, some of us were on our knees, almost like praying while that miracle was happening. And, and the same happens here. Um, the other thing is, moving on to the second question, it does need to be music. Um, the intermediality I'm addressing here is one that connects the word to real life, to reality, and is transformative of that reality. The first example was to do with painting, also shows some of them related to theatre. The other ones were to do with a particular period, as John is very rightly pointed out, of Brazilian cinema, where uh, the new Brazilian cinema became aware of the favelas again, you know, going back to that period that Arturo Trem also reminds us started in 1955 with uh, Nelson Pilsen's Hill Wagner. I don't know if we have time for more questions. They are telling me no more time. Thank you so much.